Is China the most serious challenge to the international order? The U.S. accuses Beijing of undermining global security as the Secretary of State unveiled Washington's strategy to compete with China. But is the criticism justified? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. China poses the most serious long-term challenge to the international order. That's the assessment of the U.S. Secretary of State. Antony Blinken said that as he unveiled the Biden administration's strategy to compete with China's rise as a global superpower. He insisted Washington doesn't want a new conflict, but he said under President Xi Jinping, the Chinese Communist Party is becoming more repressive at home and more aggressive abroad. Blinken gave examples including territorial disputes in the South China Sea and accused Beijing of standing with Russia on its invasion of Ukraine. We don't seek to block China from its role as a major power, nor to stop China, or any other country for that matter, from growing their economy or advancing the interests of their people. But we will defend and strengthen the international law, agreements, principles, and institutions that maintain peace and security, protect the rights of individuals and sovereign nations, and make it possible for all countries, including the United States and China, to coexist and cooperate. China is the only country with both the intent to reshape the international order and, increasingly, the economic, diplomatic, military, and technological power to do it. Beijing's vision would move us away from the universal values that have sustained so much of the world's progress over the past 75 years. China's foreign ministry denounced Blinken's remarks as typical disinformation denigrating Beijing. The international order and international rules have clear definitions. China proposes that all countries should uphold the UN-centered international system, safeguard the international order based on international law and the basic norms governing international relations, underpinned by the principle of the UN Charter. China is committed to upholding all of this. To accuse China of posing the most serious long-term challenge to the international order, if that's not disinformation, then what is? All that comes as China's foreign minister is on a 10-day tour of eight Pacific Island nations. Wang Yi is expected to push a region-wide deal to deepen security and trade cooperation. The U.S. and regional allies like Australia say that would fuel tension. President Joe Biden's recent comments on Taiwan have also angered Beijing. On Tuesday, he said the U.S. would respond militarily if the island was attacked. The White House later walked back his comments. And China's human rights record is undermining relations with Western countries. They've repeatedly criticized Beijing's crackdown on dissent in Hong Kong and alleged abuses in Xinjiang. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our guests from only in Maryland. Michael D. Swain, director of the East Asia program at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. From London, Martin Jacques, author of the book When China Rules the World. And from Beijing, Henry Huia Wang, founder of the Center for China and Globalization Think Tank. A warm welcome to you all, and thanks so much for joining us today on Inside Story. Henry, let me start with you today. In this address, Secretary of State Blinken said, put simply, United States and China have to deal with each other for the foreseeable future. That's why this is one of the most complex and consequential relationships of any that we have in the world today. First of all, how does China feel about the relationship with the U.S.? And secondly, was China expecting this speech from Secretary of State Blinken? Yes, thank you. I think that uh, actually uh, Secretary uh, Blinken's speech uh, last night was uh, was kind of expected, but uh, but also is quite uh, uh, also a bit surprised as well because we were thinking after uh, a Biden administration, you know, year and a half getting its administration, we should be making some progress on on this bilateral, you know, most bilateral <laughs> important bilateral relations in the world. Uh, but uh, but still, you know, uh, what we uh, didn't expect that is uh, 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 Secretary Blinken actually made China the, the, the number one, you know, our, our, <laughs> you know, major rivalry uh, for, for the U.S. and also post China as a threat to the global system, which I think it's not uh, uh, really uh, correct because China is really 
uh, China's rise is really good for the global uh, economy and also for the global uh, governance system. China has been contributing over one third of global GDP growth. China has become the largest trading nation with one in 30 countries. And China is actually lifted the big ability out of poverty. It's, uh, you know, this China's uh, success is really uh, uh, embraced globalization, but also uh, uh, really contribute to the globalization. So I think, you know, US and China should view each other as, uh, 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 you know, uh, cooperation. But of course, we have healthy competition as well, but not really making it as a threat, making it as a, <laughs> an enemy and making it uh, as, uh, as a uh, Secretary Blinken put it, you know, set up alliance and then compete and then invest in this kind of alliance to compete. And uh, that is not uh, what we expect, I think. But of course, you mentioned about you know climate change and uh, uh, pandemic, many other areas that China and the US still can cooperate. Mm. But I think we should do more than that, not just uh, you know on on a, on a, on a you know rivalry of each other. Michael, so so as we heard from Secretary of State Blinken, as he was unveiling. Washington's strategy to compete with China. He was also accusing Beijing of undermining global security. From your perspective, is that criticism justified? Well, I think that criticism, like with many criticisms that are leveled by both China and the United States at each other, there's an element of truth in it, but it is inflated and distorted and exaggerated in ways that I think are not healthy and that really just reinforce the kind of zero-sum thinking that both sides increasingly have towards the other. Um, China is a concern to the United States and to other countries in certain ways. Um, but the biggest concern, as I often tell people, is not of specifically China's threat to the West or to other countries. It's the threat that's posed by the kind of interactive, worst-casing, zero-sum dynamic that is increasingly coming to the fore in interactions and in relations between China and the United States and some countries of the West. It's that dynamic that's driven by these kinds of gross, large, simplistic narratives that don't account for the different complex and cross-cutting interests that the countries face. It's that kind of narrative that's really the threat to the global order. Mm. Uh, Martin, in this speech that was delivered by Secretary of State Blinken, he outlined Washington's grievances with Beijing. He said that China has become more repressive at home and more aggressive abroad under President Xi Jinping. Why deliver this speech now? How significant is it? And, and what does it do to this relationship between the U.S. and China that, that is already really at, at, at a record low point? Well, I think this is a speech we've been expecting for some time. If It's a bit belated, actually, which is the Biden administration setting out its position uh, on China. Um, and uh, 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 so, uh, so I think that it, in, in that sense, uh, we, we, could, we could see it coming. And so what, what, what does it suggest? I think it suggests uh, that, uh, that, that now the key question for the U.S., government is the relationship with China, uh, which it sees as a rival. And I think that the problem is the subtext of this speech is how does America hold on to its uh, numero uno position in the world? Can it sustain that position? And it, the whole uh, burden of the argument is uh, in various fields, how does America uh, do this? Um, uh, the tone of it in places is actually, uh, I think, quite uh, welcome, uh, particularly in the back end of the speech, uh, where he, uh, Blinken suggests areas where they can cooperate. But really, the, the heart of it is about uh, China's challenge to the position of the United States. And I'd just like to endorse one point that Henry made, which is that, you know, this is a... This is a, a caricature, actually, of China's relationship with the international system, because everything ever since Deng Xiaoping, uh, China has uh, absolutely committed itself to the international system, see seeking in the first instance to join it, and when it has joined it, has been a very strong uh, 
proponent of it and has, as it always says, in a, in, in a, in a very uh, 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 reasonable way, that it's been the great, great beneficiary of it. So this is really not an accurate presentation of, of, of the situation. Mm. What I would add to that, though, is that, of course, let's be realistic about this, that when you get the rise of a country the size of China mm -hmm. and the speed with which that transformation has taken place, it is bound to change the world in mm -hmm. profound ways. And no one can do anything about that. That's not, that is a reality. That's a historic, the great historic trend of our time. And it will continue into the future. Henry, one of the ways in which this uh, speech is being interpreted is that the U.S. is essentially saying that while we want China to, to rise, uh, we also want to make sure that China is doing so within the parameters that the U.S. has, has set. And if we could extrapolate that a little bit more, uh, one example would be, you know, China has invested heavily in the Asia-Pacific region, whereas Western nations haven't been investing as heavily. Does China see it as arrogant that other countries are saying they don't want China encroaching on those territories or, the, or that other countries are saying we want to see China do well, but only if it conforms to our standards of what they should be doing? Well, I think he probably reflect that. Uh, that's, that's correct. And, but actually, in the reality, actually, the real situation, I mean, all, look at those 30 members of, uh, of uh, India uh, Pacific uh, you know, economic framework that you have just recruited. Uh, most of them are, 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 you know, neighbors of China. And most of them, many of them, actually, almost all of them are largest trading partners with China. You know, China is their largest trading partners. So how can U.S. come out of the blue, I mean, out of very far <laughs> Pacific, to really say, hey, look, guys, let's get together and then, not allow the uh, biggest, uh, uh, you know, uh, economy in the region be part of it. Just like uh, what, uh, you know, uh, uh, U.S. used to, you know, Obama administration designed the uh, TPP, where it also had that similar function, but then China said, let's work with it, let's join it, let's work together, and the U.S. back off of that. So this, you know, how long is uh, IPEF can go, I don't know. But what I'm saying is that it's standards for the world build up all those uh, secure the military alliances and drive up every country's military budget. You know, we have a NATO expansion, we have a Five Eyes, we have a South Korea trying to join NATO intelligence war, we have uh, AUKUS focused on nuclear submarine, we have, uh, you know, Quad, now, now it's a mini, mini NATO we're probably being formed. So, so, whereas China, I think it's great, you know, we, we should pursue this economic globalization of Belt and Road, AIB, you know, and the RCEP, the largest free trade agreement, CPTPP, DIPA, you know, CHI, you know, China uh, European Investment Treaty, and China African Cooperation. So let's do more economic, uh, you know, cooperation. If if U.S. is doing that, and China is willing to be part of that, mm. but not really trying to build up the circles and then, uh, you know, uh, uh, preventing or uh, uh, blocking certain countries like China, which is already the the, the largest economy in the region mm. and also one of the rising economy uh, taking over U.S. over in 10 years' time. Michael, we know that the U.S. has not been happy with uh, China's stance when it comes to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. How much does China's reaction to that invasion uh, and how much does China's close relationship to Russia play into all of this? Well, I think that the Ukraine war and Russia's attack on Ukraine has reinforced the notion that the framing of the global order today should be democracy versus authoritarianism. Because here we have an example, supposedly, of, a, of, a, of an aggressive authoritarian state threatening a democratic or quasi-democratic state, um, and that this is, is just a harbinger of things to come. And so people then look at China and say, well, China is an authoritarian state too, and Taiwan's a democracy, and China has designs on Taiwan. So China's going to attack Taiwan just like Russia attacked Ukraine. So you get this deepening sense of this uh, alarming threat um, posed by these uh, types of states, when in fact, the calculations, the, the stakes involved, the interests involved in these two cases are quite different. And it is a gross simplification and a distortion of the reality 
to simply apply what's going on in Ukraine to what the Chinese could do today uh, to Taiwan. Now, it has, of course, in some ways, um, reinforced the image of China and Russia being aligned with each other, which they are in certain respects. China has not come out and full-throatedly endorsed the Western and NATO position about the nature of the war, even though China very much opposes invasions of sovereign countries by other countries. Um, and China, however, mm -hmm. does not want to come out openly and reject Russia, but it, 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 it does not also want to come out and fully endorse what Russia has done, support Russia, and try to prevent the West from pressuring Russia. Henry, uh, Michael there brought up uh, Taiwan. Uh, of course, this is playing a role right now when it comes to the U.S.'s relationship with China. You had President Biden uh, in his recent comments on Taiwan. Uh, those comments angered Beijing. Uh, on Tuesday, he said that the U.S. would respond militarily if the island was attacked. The White House later walked back those comments. Uh, but how much has that upset Beijing? Well, I think it's quite upset. I mean, you know, yeah, uh, President Xi and President Biden have been talking uh, virtually on the phone quite, quite a few times. And every time President Biden said, you know, we, we respect China, we don't want to seek to change China or seek alliance against China, uh, we, 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 we were a bit by one China policy. But every time that uh, when he talked to other people, he, he, he sounds different. So, so that's really, you know, made China kind of uh, difficult to, to understand. But also, I think this Ukraine thing has really served as a good reminder to the people uh, of all the, uh, you know, whether NATO or U.S. or Russia or China, because, uh, you see, when, when sovereignty and territorial integrity is violated, that, that's really going to cause big international condemnation and, and criticism. I mean, Taiwan is recognized by 160, 70 countries in the world as part of China. That's the condition to establish diplomatic ties with China. It's part of China. So China national sovereignty and territory integrity should be respected. Same as Ukraine. So I think China, you know, uh, hold that principle. You know, U.S. should hold that principle not against Ukraine, but also should really apply that to the Taiwan situation, respect the sovereignty and territory integrity of China, which I think, you know, U.S. is not really doing well on that. And that really caused a lot of uh, upset and also criticism on the international front as well. Martin, I know that you touched on this a little bit in your previous answer, but is what we're hearing currently from the Biden administration, whether it's this address from Secretary of State Blinken or whether it's uh, President Biden's remarks with regards to Taiwan, does that signal a new policy toward China or, or are things really more or less the same? I mean, is the stance that the Biden administration is taking toward China right now close to the stance that the Trump administration was taking toward China? Uh, yes, I, th I think the, the simple answer to that is yes. Uh, it, of course, there are certain differences of emphasis and uh, uh, and uh, tone, uh, but basically what's been striking about the Biden administration is the extent to which it's more or less inherited the Trump position uh, on China. It's less bombastic. It doesn't exaggerate in quite the same way uh, that Trump did. But basically, I think we're witnessing a consensual shift in American politics towards a new, uh, a new antagonism uh, towards uh, China. Uh, I don't think we're in a new Cold War yet, but it's certainly got aspects of that. And as Michael said earlier on, you know, the danger of this kind of situation is that uh, uh, the... the the, the more extreme, different situations suggest, can suggest more extreme uh, views, extreme conflicts, and you get this slippage, and I think we've witnessed this in a number of ways so far, sl slippage towards a greater antagonism between uh, the two countries. I mean, I think we're set, you know, the, I'm afraid to say this, but I think this is going to go on for a long time. Um, and... Uh, and in, in fact, in some ways, one of the interesting things about the statement, of course, it's not new, but uh, one of the interesting things about the statement is that America is, is sort of preparing itself for the long haul in relationship to this. Um, hence, for example, the emphasis on the importance of improving American competitiveness, American com uh, economic capacities in, in lots of different areas. The truth is that America have, you know, savagely neglected 
these kind of questions for a long time. And so any long-term strategy that America has, I think this has to be at the heart of the matter because basically, you know, China's been uh, uh, taking the US to the cleaners when it comes to this kind of thing over the last 20 years. Michael, I saw you nodding along to quite a bit of what uh, Martin was saying. It looked like you wanted to jump in, so please go ahead. I want to make the point that for the Trump administration, I think the Trump administration's policy towards China was kind of chaotic. I mean, you had different messages being said by different people at different times. And then, of course, President Trump just riffs as he wishes. Uh, so the policy was really not very clear in many ways, except it did have a heavy ideological tinge to it and had a very heavy kind of trade balance tinge to it that was based on a very simplistic understanding of global trade. Um, but it also wasn't very strategic. And I think where the, where the Biden administration has altered uh, that approach is they've become more organized. I wouldn't say fully strategic, but they've become more organized in that they are looking for coalitions and groups of other countries to strengthen their relations with other countries, allies and others, in order to develop a broader kind of strategy for countering China. But the problem with that is that underneath all this, as others have alluded, is the assumption, and you've seen it in Blinken's speech, that there really isn't much point in engaging the Chinese. We know what the Chinese are, and that's defined in very stark terms as a threat, almost an existential threat in almost every area. Yes, we can cooperate with them on areas where there's a strong common interest, like climate change. But if you're, if you're really in a zero-sum relationship with the Chinese of intense confrontational competition, it can't but influence greatly mm -hmm. areas where you need to cooperate. Plus, plus, what this statement, what this outlook suggests is that because you can't talk to the Chinese because it doesn't serve any purpose because the Chinese won't really respond in, in good faith to you. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you can't really engage directly with the Chinese on truly divisive issues. You just sort of discount that as a basis for conversation with the Chinese and work on trying to shape, counter, contain the Chinese. That's the problem with the Biden strategy. Henry, Michael just touched on something that you mentioned in a, in a previous answer, and that's the fact that Secretary of State Blinken did say in his remarks that there are areas where the two countries should work together, including climate crisis, including combating COVID-19. Um, from your perspective, where are there some other areas that the two countries feel they can actually work together constructively right now? Yes, I, I think that I agree with uh, what just Michael said. You know, the, 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 the positive narrative that's going on in both countries are really damaging this relation and probably also uh, dampen the confidence to cooperate in the future. But I think there's a tremendous, there's so much to collaborate. I mean, in addition to what Michael said on climate change and others, I think on the infrastructure, for example, you know, China is the leading country now for the last four decades. China has, you know, transformed the whole country. China now has two thirds of the global speed railway, 10 largest container report, uh, ports now, seven of them are in China. And China have uh, five, six million 4G, 5G stations across the country and one billion smartphone users. So that infrastructure now become a consensus. We see that, uh, you know, uh, President Biden proposed 1.2 trillion infrastructure plan, and EU has announced a, a global <laughs> gateway, uh, 300 billion euros to put into that. So why not? You know, we work together, like what I talked to Larry Summers. You know, let's have uh, strengthen the development banks, replenish the World Bank. Let's get AIB on, in action. Let's get ADB, AFDB, Inter-American Development Bank. Let's get the development banks where share the same language to work together to tackle the. Uh, you know, deficit of infrastructure of many developing countries, including mm -hmm. the developed countries. But also, absolutely, the, uh, uh, you know, now we're going to have the post-pandemic and post-Ukraine war. Maybe mm -hmm. let's have a new Marshall Plan on the infrastructure to help on that. So let's find something similar to work together to, so that we, we can really uh, not obsessed with our differences and exaggerate and then really, you know, blow that out of proportion and then mm -hmm. we are really <laughs> have to fight with the other in the end. So that's very dangerous, I think. All right. Well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave our conversation there today. Thank you so much to all of our guests, Michael Swain, Martin Jacques, and Henry Huiao Wang.
And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Mohammed Jamjum, and the whole team here, bye for now.